Disasters reduce everything to a common denominator. Great soaring buildings, stately ocean liners, cozy homes, sleek racing cars, all become junk. Twisted, crumbled, smashed, charred junk. And any soft bodies in the way, warm, breathing compilations of memories and loves and delights and desires become less than junk. You can sometimes salvage the junk, recycle the steel, reuse the lumber, but there's nothing you can do with the torn, shattered, burned, drowned, suffocated refuse that once, like you and I, was human. From space, a hurricane in the making is a pinwheel of fantasy. A spiraling wonder made of puffs and gauze. For the hurricane hunters, it is not fantasy, but hard and punishing reality. And a job to be done. Crew from pilot, we are starting our penetration run. Hot spot on. Engineer, maintain my airspeed at 190 knots. Hi, sir. Go ahead, Nico. Inside the whirling vortex lies a calm that is almost otherworldly. Yet it is here in the sense that the storm cooks. Fed by the rising moisture-laden air and given spin by the rotation of the earth, it creates its own momentum, generating the winds that become its motive force. August 1969, 
the third hurricane of the season is spotted, tracked, and measured. She is named Camille, but she will bear little resemblance to that pale and sickly lady of the flowers. The storm crosses the Yucatan Peninsula and then stops. For two days, she lingers over the warm waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Hurricane warnings go up along the Florida Panhandle. High winds and flood tides affect the whole coast. People here are used to hurricanes. It's part of the accepted price for living in paradise. Camille turns like a dancer in a pirouette and makes her move, heading away from Florida and toward the Mississippi and Louisiana coastline. New warnings flash up. Most people take heed. Over 100,000 pick up and get out, heading north. Some don't. The surf has never been so up, and there isn't a lifeguard in sight. There is a tradition in these parts where almost any occasion is an acceptable excuse for a celebration. People gather in motels along the shore and hold hurricane parties. By mid-afternoon, advance winds have already driven the water well above the high tide mark. Forecasters are astonished by the readings they are getting. Reports of Camille's approach take on new urgency. Mississippi and Louisiana shore has had little time to prepare. With the eye of the hurricane still out to sea, reports come in that her winds are reaching over 200 miles an hour, the highest ever recorded. Now weathermen begin to worry about what kind of water those winds are pushing. By early evening, it is apparent that Camille will hurt. turn in their courses to flow back upon themselves. Levees crumble, whole towns are blown down and washed away. Utility poles snap and wires burst. The stretch of coast between Gulfport and Biloxi, called by some the Riviera of the South, is underwater.
Camille reaches inland, dumping more water on an already drenched landscape, ripping up live oak trees that had withstood every other storm for over a century. There seems to be no limit to her fury. Some low-lying areas, snakes driven out of the marshes add to the panic. <laughs> Just before midnight, a tidal surge rises in the Gulf. Thirty feet high at the crest, it is thrown against the helpless coast. Daylight reveals a battered wasteland. Camille is the worst storm of any kind to hit the United States in a hundred years of keeping records. She roars north over Tennessee, then crosses the Blue Ridge Mountains. Finally, she moves back into the Atlantic where she subsides in trailing winds and sprinkles. Some 400 people are dead. Over 400,000 are homeless. Property damage is estimated at a billion dollars. Along the Gulf Coast, the survivors begin a reckoning. Five couples had a, a hurricane party, and uh, some of our, some of the friends that uh, lived here were over here looking for their friends that were in the party, and they can't be found. Say, I knew about 20 people here. I didn't stay because my parents were worried and they called my fiance and insisted that he come and drag me home and he coerced me very strongly to come just with the clothes on my back, a change of underwear. The man on the second floor, he had a drink and he told me to come on up and join the party that they were going to stay on the third floor and I told him no, this was too serious. I told him to get out. In fact, I even told him I would call the civil defense and see if I could put him out. So I called the civil defense man and I was talking to him on the police radio and the last thing he told me was to go back and get his uh, address of the next of kin so we can notify him. And he looked at me and he laughed. He's found to be in here somewhere because all these are the houses that came from in this vicinity. They're all right in here in this neighborhood. But mine was right on the corner, not on even the <laughs> that grave when you under that smile. <sighs> All you have left is your dog? That's right. <laughs> I'm going to hang on to her. I'm going to hang on to her. Well, I was in the next room, so I saw him go out. The walls just fell apart. We went out rushing with the water. Yes, I have a brother and sister, but... We, we're looking for him right now. And Junior, darling, we all all right, sweetheart. I love you. Now, don't worry about us. We all right, darling. And hello to all of you. Thank the Lord. Another one will never catch us here, because if we hear of another one coming, we're leaving here and go way upstate, like you asked Mama to do. So, okay, now, I love y'all. So, we all all right. It isn't destroyed, one man said. It's gone. A pilot flying over the area said it looked as if a giant bulldozer had scraped the countryside flat. Five years later, they were still repairing the damage wrought by Camille.
There are some disasters that not only take lives, but destroy whole episodes of human endeavor. Lighter than air travel was a good idea. It still is. But nobody has proposed a passenger carrying dirigible in a long time. <laughs> Ever since the day Icarus stuck wings on his back with wax and flew up toward the sun, man has reached for the sky. Unfortunately, the wax melted and Icarus fell back to Earth. But man refused to give up. There was something about floating through the sky. One early daredevil said, it's as close to freedom as you can get. The only law up there is the law of gravity. Unfortunately, there were other laws. Like the one that says, don't let the hot air heater get too close to the fabric. Undaunted still, pioneers like Auguste Picard pursued the dream. The Explorer was the culmination of those first efforts. It would sail higher than any balloon had ever gone, over 13 miles up. It took ballooning to the realm of serious science. It introduced a new word, stratosphere, into everyday usage and it carried three men to the threshold of space. It did all this and returned on time and on target, folding up like a flower wilting at the end of its season. But the season for lighter than air travel was just starting. Designers stretched out the gas bags, added tail fins, attached engines, and set out to do what Icarus could not. The dirigibles could lift many times their weight in passengers and cargo, used a minimum of fuel, sailed more quietly and steadily than the finest ocean liners, and could stay aloft for days. There seemed to be no limit to their potential. The ships used lighter-than-air gas. Helium was preferred because hydrogen was explosively flammable. They could be maneuvered with such accuracy, a new class of mail service was instituted from the mast of the Empire State Building direct to all the ships at sea. Their safety record was as impressive as their performance. With helium, a broken nose was just a broken nose. Landing was tricky. Men had to haul them down with ropes. Water was used as ballast. The airship Los Angeles served nine trouble-free years and proved the reliability of dirigibles. Its comings and goings at the Naval Air Station at Lakehurst, New Jersey, were popular events. Man seemed finally to have conquered the skies. The idea of drifting through the air as comfortably as sitting in your own living room held enormous appeal. Airplanes were still cramped and bumpy. The big ships were transformed from flying cigars to floating parlors, great bubbles of serenity, majestic and thrilling, the perfect union of science and poetry. Wonder followed wonder. The airship Akron was so large it had room aboard for two small planes that could drop off and hook on in mid-air. But this ship was to become a jinx, and perhaps an omen. Attempting to land after a trouble-plagued cross-country flight, a sudden gust of wind took her aloft. Three men froze. It was two hours before the captain could bring the ship down with the sole survivor. And I became the man that jumped off the hidden boy. I am Joseph Spa. For 45 years, I have been an acrobat and almost made my life with a dangerous act called the lamppost climber. Have traveled the world and have used every means of transportation 
But at no time in my travels around the world did I ever think that the day would come that I would have to board a Zeppelin. And this happened to me in 1937. However, when I stood on the Flughafen in Frankfurt and saw this big monster on the earth being brought out, it dwarfed at me in a way. Once on board, I had taken my camera you know, and uh, I wanted to take a picture as the Zeppelin was leaving the ground. The word ship up had been given and very quietly, without even noticing anything, the Zeppelin started to rise in the air. She was the most elegant airship ever built. The Hindenburg was the pride of Nazi Germany. Launched a year earlier, she had already made 17 transatlantic crossings. So successful was she that 11 extra passenger cabins were added for her first flight of 1937. And I was astounded how large the accommodations were. Big living room, dining room, recreation rooms. And as we were called to dinner, I had a feeling not that I was on a Zeppelin or up in the air, that I was back on a big ocean liner again. And I had no thoughts where they could prepare food like that. I found out later on that, that they had a complete kitchen, an electrified kitchen and everything on board. And more and more, I had more confidence. That strangeness that, had, uh, that I had first in being dwarfed by the monster left me, especially where I was inside in those great recreation rooms with everyone being happy. At no time do I think that anyone ever mentioned that something could happen. It seemed too safe. And I started to film anything that I thought would be of interest to me, my family, or anyone that one could see doing a flight of the Zeppelin. Then in the distance, I saw the first lightning. And one of the uh, officers of the Zeppelin, and he came over to me and started to talk to me and tell me there is nothing to worry about that a Zeppelin can fly right through a storm, or like in our case right now, we will fly right around it. We saw great huge icebergs sticking out of the ocean and at that time I was thinking about the Titanic. I could not help thinking about it, how dangerous it must be on the ocean in riding around and then hitting an iceberg. Unlike American airships, the Hindenburg used hydrogen because the U.S. was the sole source of helium and sale of the gas to Germany was forbidden. We came along Long Island Sound and then of course saw New York, which was to me the most thrilling thing. After cruising around New York, we made for Lake Hurst and the skies became a little dark. The weather looked troublesome ahead. It's not so easy to land such a bulk as a Zeppelin in anything but a, a very quiet wind. We were now informed that uh, we cannot land at this time because the weather conditions were unfavorable. On the ground, the crowd included those waiting to board the Hindenburg for her return flight, a contingent of reporters, and a radio announcer named Herb Morrison. How do you do, everyone? We're greeting you now from the Naval Air Base at Lake Hurst, New Jersey, from which point we're going to bring you a description of the landing of the mammoth airship Hindenburg which was due here in America this morning at dawn, completing the first transatlantic crossing of the 1937 season. 
But here it comes, ladies and gentlemen, and what a great sight it is. A thrilling one. It's a marvelous sight. It's coming down out of the sky, pointed directly towards us and toward the mooring mast. The ship is riding majestically toward us like some great feather, riding as though it was mighty proud of the place it's playing in the world's aviation. The ship is no doubt busting with activity, as we can see. Orders are shouted to the crew. The passengers are probably lining the windows, looking down at the field ahead of them, getting their glimpse of the mooring mast. There were people below waving up to us, and I thought with what I could see, it was my wife and children, and I put the camera against my eye and tried to take a picture of it. It's practically standing still now. They've dropped ropes out of the nose of the ship. It's been taken a hold up down on the field by a number of men. It's starting to rain again. It's, the rain had uh, slacked up a little bit. The back motors of the ship are just holding it. It's burst into flames. Get this started, get this started. It's right and it's crazy. It's crazy terrible. Oh my, get out of the way, please. It's burning, bursting into flames and, and it's falling on the morning fast. All oh, the folks with me that this is terrible. This is the one of the worst catastrophes in the world. Oh, it's oh, it's right, running. Oh, all the humanity and all the passengers screaming around me. I told you. I can't even talk to people. It's a, it's, it's a, oh. I, I can't talk, ladies and gentlemen. Honestly, it's just laying there on massive smoking wreckage. <laughs> and everybody can hardly breathe and talk and scream. Lady, I, I'm sorry. Honestly, I, I can hardly breathe. I, I'm going to step inside where I cannot see it. <laughs> Charlie, that's terrible. <laughs> I can't... My first thought was out. People began to scream and holler. I took the camera and hit this plastic window, and I started to climb out. My left leg caved in as I hit the ground. I was trying to crawl away, and uh, then I saw this big man. He came running toward me, picked me up, dragged me clear, and ran with me, and then threw me down on the ground. I raced down to the burning ship. I met a man coming out, uh, dazed, dazed. He couldn't find his way. I grabbed a hold of him. So Mr. Spay, it sounds like Spay, we're not sure of it. And he told me he jumped. He jumped with other passengers. I knew that I was very fortunate. And I say that thanks to God that he spared me for now. The only thing I can do is say that, I don't know, it all happened so fast. There isn't much to figure about. I do think that I'm very lucky that I'm sitting home here, in my own home again, after this experience this afternoon. And as I said before, I'm just happy. The calls that we have, the people that I meet consistently, if there are new people, someone will go and remind them. And I became the man that jumped off the hidden bush. And one day I went into a little dry goods store to get a newspaper and some candy, and there were three little girls. And as I came in, one said, oh, this is Mr. Spa, this is the man. I could hear this, and I had an idea, this will be about the hidden again. So finally one of them said, why don't you go over and ask him? So one of them came over, and she said, Mr. Spa, are you really the man that fell off the Empire State Building? Ever wonder what the world was like at the beginning? Or might be at the end? There are places on Earth where you can get some idea. It's a landscape on another planet. A moment recovered from time primeval. A glimpse of a vision of an image of a dream of hell. April 1971. Mount Etna, one of the world's most active volcanoes, comes alive again. 11,000 feet of cinders. Mount Etna was called the Forge of Vulcan, the god of fire by the Romans. 
emperors would come to watch a power mightier than theirs. Now scientists gather to learn. A team of scientists headed by Harun Taziev tries to get close enough to measure the hot gases. Asbestos suits and fiberglass helmets protect them from the 2,000 degree heat. We try to roll the stick in there for 15 seconds to get a good reading. Then we run like hell. main crater is plugged solid from the last eruption seven years earlier. But there are hundreds of cracks in the mountain, and one stream of liquid rock emerges from a fissure only a thousand feet up the slope, close enough to threaten nearby vineyards and villages. Etna's lava has made the Sicilian soil the richest in Italy, renewing it regularly for over 2,000 years. Local farmers have a nickname for Mount Etna. It's Bonaccione, the big, good-natured fellow. As the good-natured fellow begins to devour their fields, it becomes a monster, without reason, without mercy, without recourse. The monster seems insatiable. Taziev suggests bombing the slopes to open new vents for the lava to flow safely away from populated areas. He is met by a hail of protest and a 17th century Sicilian law that forbids any deflection of the lava from its natural course. It used to be good for business, Bonaccione. Tourists come to see, we do all right, eh? But this, this is not good. Now 
now it is no longer a question of whether, but when. The flow is moving at the rate of a quarter of a mile a day. Nothing can withstand it. Tourists line the roads and cheer at each new display of pyrotechnics. But eventually, the awesome power of the beast stills even then. For generations, Mount Etna has allowed the people of Fornazzo to live on its slopes, grow grapes, make wine. Now it has reclaimed them. What can we do? We got no place to go. We stay here, build again, plant again, eh? And one day, the lava ship comes again. For 69 days, the lava rolls unimpeded, unchallenged leaving behind it a surface as barren as the moon, echoing sobs. Nature follows her own rules. Some of them we know and respect, others we seem to have trouble learning. Even when they come step by step and fully illustrated. It was bountiful country. The Western Plains, the great bread basket where the amber waves of grain seem to roll on forever like some practical vision of eternity. Back in 1927, I had a little farm and I called it heaven. Price was up and the rain come down and I hauled my crops all into town. I got the money, bought clothes and groceries, fed the kids, took it easy. Make enough to live on and get by on and live decent on. You work hard, work honest. But the land was not inexhaustible. Years of overplanting pretty well used it up. And then the rains didn't come one year, or the next, only the steady sun. The land dried up. Then the depression hit. Prices dropped. <laughs> The farmers, in hock for seed and tools and groceries, tried to squeeze one more crop out of the caked earth. But it didn't have one to give. Finally, the plows could only make marks, not furrows. After a while, the only crop we got was dust. Couldn't turn it, couldn't water it, couldn't eat it. All you could do was wait for it to go away. Rainmakers and water witches did a lot of business, but there just wasn't any to find. A wave of religion rolled over the countryside. People who had stooped to plant and reap now bent to pray and repent. But it didn't seem as if anybody was listening. When the money ran out, when the sheriff came around with a notice from the bank, when the last bit of hope dried up with the land, there was nothing to do but move on. They packed up what they could, pulled up roots that had gone down for generations, and went from being farmers to being migrants. 
few stayed on, dogged, determined, not ready to give the land over to desert yet. They dug in and dug out. Well, there weren't nowhere else I wanted to go. And you know, you let the devil beat you one time, he's always going to be after you. Others couldn't hack it. I lived here 25 years on this land. Up to four years ago, we always made a living and had plenty. Now, after four years of drought, we have to move away, go someplace else to make a living. I'll sing this song, but I'll sing it again, of the place that I lived on the West Texas Plains. In the city of Tampa, the county of Gray, here's what all of the people Say, well, it's so long, it's been good to know you, so long, it's been good to know you, so long, it's been good to know you, this dusty old dust is a blowing me home, I've got to be drifting along. The dust had been a long time in coming, and it didn't seem in any hurry to go. Eventually, when it finally blew clear across the country, Washington decided it was time to do something about it. All over the Dust Bowl, there were last man clubs formed by men who swore they would be the last to leave. The government signed them up to tame the drifting dust and make it behave like farmland. tree planting program was launched, an investment in the future. Stands of cottonwood, pine, elm, and locust were planted down through the plains from the Canadian border to the Mexican. These shelter belts were to serve as windbreakers, to interrupt the open sweep of country and contain the scouring winds. Twenty years later, they stand like sentinels in ordered rows, holding the wind in their branches, and the soil in their roots. The land came back. Farmers planted, reaped, raised cattle, and told stories about the great dust bowl. The price of wheat and meat went up. The temptation to cash in was strong. People forget. Some overplanted the land again. Some overgrazed it. Some even cut down the sheltering trees to make more room for more paying crops. People forget, but the land doesn't. So long, it's been good to know you. So long, been good to know you. So long, it's been good to know you. This dusty old dust is a blowing me home. I've got to be rolling along. You know, it's one thing to suffer disaster. It's another to court it. Some people seek danger out, flirt with it, test themselves against it. For these people, life is best savored close to death. Make a 
a machine that goes faster and somebody will race it and push it to the limit. But you never know where that limit is exactly until you get there. the greatest feeling in the world. You just go, man, all out. Racing is now our number one sport. Its Super Bowl is the Indianapolis 500, a two and a half mile oval track with all left turns. Some say people come to see the crashes. Well, if that's true, they regularly get their money's worth. The world goes by like a blur. Reaction ain't enough. You've got to anticipate trouble. You've got to depend on the machine under you. And sometimes the crowd gets more than it bargained for. Spectacular crashes brought demands for better safety measures. A race car full of high-test fuel is a hurtling bomb. But most proposals would cut the speed. And nobody was ready to do that. Not until 1973. That was the year Andy Granatelli brought three of the fastest machines ever designed to Indy. And three of the best drivers, including Swede Savage and Gordon Johncock. Savage is the bright hope of the STP team. He turns out for his qualifying heat in the Red Eagle Offenhauser number 40. Just finished a year of hospital care following a serious crash at the Ontario Speedway in California. He feels this will be his year at Indy. A seasoned driver at 26, he is known for stretching the limits of both track and machine. lap is clocked at 197 miles per hour, the fastest yet, and the crowd acts as if he already had the race wrapped up. He wins the coveted pole position, number one to start. Teammate Gordon Johncock also qualifies, but veteran Art Pollard's car veers into a wall and disintegrates. Holland is killed, widely loved and respected in the racing community. His loss will later be regarded as an omen. Race day dawns bright, if not clear. The fastest field in the history of the track awaits a crowd of 350,000 fans. The pre-race hoopla goes off on schedule with a special ovation for 23 just returned prisoners of war on hand to watch this particular bit of Americana. But the skies don't hold. On and off rains cause a four hour delay in the start. Crews are nervous. When the weather breaks, officials give the go ahead. There is a palpable release of tension as the business of racing begins. All the last minute details push everything else out of mind. This is what they're here for.
but in their rush onto the track, something is wrong. The cars seem unable to find their proper places. Instead of a neat lineup in the pace lap, the field looks like a freeway traffic jam. Somebody screwed us up. Swede didn't get the pole position. I don't even know where I was. But the starter waves the green flag, and the cars leap into the race. First lap, Salt Walter careens into a wire mesh fence, spewing 75 gallons of burning fuel onto the crowd. A dozen spectators are injured. Walter, at 25, the youngest driver on the track, is badly burned. The race proceeds slowly under the yellow flag, but by now the drizzle has turned into a downpour, and officials call for the red flag. The lineup for the second day start is no more organized than the first, but there is an urgency now to get on with it, as if a start could somehow hold back the rain which threatens again. But it's a vain hope. With drops already spattering on their helmets, the drivers follow the pace car to the red flag. day is gray, but so far, dry. Less than half the fans wait through five uncertain hours to early afternoon. Then... A break in the clouds makes it seem as if the ominous events of the past week have been settled somehow. The jinx lifted. Athletes key themselves up to an event. Postponement winds nerves tight but the strain imposed by the two false starts dissolves in the roar of the powerful engines. Pollard's death is not forgotten, but for the moment set aside. Walther is hurt, but okay. And the race is on. Hart's leap as smoke signals trouble on the third turn. But the only casualty is a burnt out motor and the pace car leaves the field to the races. Bobby Unser in a White Eagle takes the early lead. His brother Al is also in this race. A third brother injured in a racing accident years ago and now confined to a motorized wheelchair is chief mechanic. On the second lap, Bobby Ellison, star of the Southern Stock Car Circuit, is forced to pack it in with engine trouble. We were keeping up a good clip but it wasn't sprint time, you know? The track was slick and, well, we were just kind of cautious. On the fourth lap, Peter Repson slides into a wall. He survives. By the ninth lap, Swede Savage has gotten back up to third place. His average speed so far is 180. He turns in for a pit stop for fuel and a fresh pair of right side tires, the side that gets most wear on the bank turns. In record time, his crew has the car ready to roll again. Teammate Gordon Johncock in number 20 has been moving up, and the third STP driver, rookie Graham McRae, is holding his own. The pit stop drops Savage back. Johncock now holds third place. By the 58th lap, Savage has overtaken John Cock and is threatening the new leader, Al Unser. At slippery turn number four, Savage loses control. Fire trucks race across the pit area to the site of the crash, 
and STP mechanic Armando Terran runs to help. Savage and Terran are both rushed to the hospital. Terran is dead on arrival. Savage will hang on for a month before this race takes its final toll. When rain finally halts the race, John Cock is declared winner. New safety standards follow, but the race is still to the swiftest. Who can see the wind? Neither you nor I. But when the trees are bending down, the wind is passing by. Robert Louis Stevenson wrote that. He was English and had never experienced a tornado. It was a picture book town in the heart of America. Comfortable old houses surrounded by flowers, quiet shaded streets, and a business section where almost everybody knew almost everybody. Most spring days, the loudest noise was the buzzing of the bees. Zinnia, Ohio, was totally unprepared for the wrath that was to descend on it and strip the town virtually naked. April 3rd, 1974. The weather had been unsettled all day. We'll keep you posted as we get further information from the United States Weather Bureau. By mid-afternoon, tornado conditions were reported in the surrounding countryside. The severe weather forecast is in effect and will remain in effect until 8 o'clock tonight. Let's take a look now at these clouds as they are forming in the distance. This is looking toward the west-northwest of the Channel 6 studios. You can see a great deal of turbulence in these clouds. They're dipping, falling, rising once again. I don't know what that's from. All in all, it looks now as though we might just have uh, rather severe conditions on our hands. These clouds continue to swirl about us, sometimes dipping, sometimes rising. The winds have picked up considerably in the last few minutes. If you look down near the horizon now, John, uh, this should be to the right of your screen. You'll see some more dust or smoke being picked up from here, it appears to be, along the river bottoms. So there's a great deal of turbulence right within this area. Now, now we have another uh, appearance of a funnel. Yes. Can, you, can you swing around and get that, please? Uh, oh, that is a funnel jack and a big one. but it came too fast. I wedged myself behind the stove, and I could hear the nails popping out of the walls before it hit. It was so huge, it just seemed to be all around us. It got black as night, and the air felt funny, and there was this god-awful noise, like a bunch of freight trains. It sounded like the sky was full of jet airplanes. It reminded me of a bus song. Most people take what shelter they can find. Some venture out for a better look at nature on the rampage. 
unaware that the winds in the center of a twister can spin over 500 miles an hour. Teenager Bruce Boyd grabs his parents' 8-millimeter camera and points it out the window. It was spooky, but what a sight. I guess I didn't realize till later what could have happened. It wiped out a house just across the street. Moving through Xenia on a diagonal path that is sometimes a half mile wide, the tornado strikes at random, smashing some buildings into splinters, but leaving others untouched. called it the finger of God, others the tale of the devil. No one could remember anything like it. Later, no one wanted to remember. It was just like some big thing pushing at me. It was funny how quiet the dogs got. We should all be dead as what? everything we have. But until you've lived through it and seen the real thing, you just have no idea. Got in the car and went home, I thought it'd be the safest place, but when I got in the door, the house fell in on us. The tornado that hits Xenia, Ohio, is only one of over a hundred twisters that played through 11 states that day, claiming 300 victims before they dissolved. Kids are still don't want to go to bed. They're afraid that maybe another one's going to come, or uh, or maybe they just won't wake up again. They just don't know what to think. It's it's really scary. As a matter of fact, out here in our backyard, we had a set of blue jays and a set of cardinals, and the squirrel that climbed the tree. There weren't any, there was no bird. All there were was people and trash. Amazingly, only 33 people lose their lives. 1,000 are injured, over 2,000 homes are destroyed. Some of the debris is carried 200 miles north before dropping out of the sky. An editorial in the Daily Gazette says, great communities have come from tragedy. When asked how he was going to start, one old-time resident said, one stick at a time. Ohio Grit will have to see them through. There is very little else left. We'll make it. The, the birds are back already. The, the trees will take longer. The house? Uh, we were thinking of building a new one anyway. In the aftermath of accidents, we scramble around looking for causes. Attaching reasons or assigning blame makes us feel better. It might also help prevent another. Mechanical failure is the best. Find it, fix it, forget it. But what about that most elusive of all causes, perhaps most common, human error? They were called floating palaces, and the Andrea Doria was the Camelot of the fleet, the most luxurious ship on the transatlantic run, and the last of her kind. There is something for everyone here. As the brochure said, 
She must provide her passengers with an experience that will somehow be different, one they will never forget as long as they live. I lived like a king is what I did. It was playing party all day and half the night. July 25th, 1956. Only a day away from docking in New York, everybody is looking forward to one last fling. That morning, the Swedish liner Stockholm leaves New York. She boasts a specially reinforced bow designed to break through heavy ice. In mid-afternoon, the Andrea Doria hits fog. Her captain takes normal precautions, closing the watertight doors and sounding the fog horn. Everyone is aware of the fog. Few are worried. To some, the note of the fog horn adds to the romance of the last night out. With darkness, the Doria's captain decides to cut the ship's speed slightly, again according to normal procedures. Nobody was nervous. Nobody thought about it. They got radar now and all that stuff. It was just a lovely party. Everybody felt fine and happy. At 10.40, the Andrea Doria's radar registers a new blip. With a Nantucket light ship already 20 minutes behind her, this one is recorded as a moving vessel, 17 miles ahead. I just didn't want it to ever end. I was having too much fun. The Stockholm is on course and in clear weather, running at her top speed of 18 knots. At 10.48, she picks up an approaching ship 12 miles ahead and slightly to starboard. At 11 o'clock, the distance is put at six miles. By 11.03, at four. The traffic lane through the North Atlantic is one of the busiest in the world. But universally accepted rules of the road make the safe passage of ships, even in fog, almost routine. At 11.05, the Doria's captain determines the approaching ship is five miles off. Two of his officers argue it is closer to three. He orders a slight turn to the left, four degrees, to widen the space for a right-to-right -right passing. At 11.06, the Stockholm is still running in clear weather, but the fog bank can be seen off to port. A radar puts the Doria at two miles. The third mate orders a 20 degree turn to the right for a left to left passing. The maneuver puts them unknowingly on a collision course. By the time the Stockholm's bridge realizes what is happening, it is too late. It, it was like a nightmare. There, there was no way out. The Doria turns hard. The ship's telegraph flashes full speed astern. The chirping of SOS fills the night. Astonished relay stations read the call and race to answer. Over 2,500 lives are at stake. This is John Tillman speaking from the plane Miss Daily News. We're en route to cover the collision between the Italian liner Andrea Doria and the Swedish ship Stockholm, which occurred last night some 45 miles southeast of Nantucket. As we circle, certainly is a sorry sight, a very sad sight indeed, to see the pride of the Italian fleet, the luxury liner, the 29,000-ton Andrea Doria, wallowing here in the Atlantic Ocean. Listing so badly, only half her lifeboats could be launched. She was nonetheless abandoned in good order. By dawn, all known survivors had been taken off. 
Although the Stockholm's bow was ripped away on impact, she remains seaworthy and assists in the rescue operation. Among the survivors that line the decks, almost half are crew members of the Doria. The ocean-going tug Cape Anne and the liner Ile de France finish the job of picking up survivors and leave for New York. Of the 1,706 passengers and crew members of the Andrea Doria, 46 are lost. Aboard the Stockholm, five seamen are dead. It is a miracle that the toll wasn't heavier. At 5.30 in the morning, the captain is among the last to leave his dying vessel. Now he waits for the inevitable. She does not go quickly or dramatically, but settles with as much grace as dying permits, giving up only by degrees as the insistent waters fill her hull, flooding the great ballroom that only hours before rang with music and laughter seeping into the corners where lovers stood, rushing through the corridors lined with treasures of art. She is a long time dying, as if to signal fully the regret of it all. For with her, the era of the luxury liner has come to an end. At 10.09, the ship many call the most beautiful in the world took her place in the graveyard of the Atlantic. The Ile de France is the first to reach New York with survivors. Last to arrive is the Stockholm, bearing another miracle. Ship's officers discover a young girl snatched from her bed aboard the Andrea Doria by the Stockholm's bow, but still alive in the twisted wreckage. With the final list of the missing still incomplete, those on the docks anxiously scan the railing of the Stockholm. Among the watchers is actress Ruth Roman. On board the Andrea Doria, she had handed her three-year-old son into a lifeboat, which then pulled away. Rescued later by the Ile de France, she still hasn't seen him. The ordeal is over. For some, all that is left is to weep and to mourn. Recrimination and accusation would come soon enough. For most, it is a time for thankful joy. a despicable display of cowardice on the part of the complete personnel of the Andrea Doria from the captain down. I could sing you a song or write you a book about him. We never saw an officer in the four hours we were there. We never heard one single solitary word from the bridge. Nothing was organized at all. We never saw, to use bad English, we never saw nothing. I am very much satisfied. The crew's done a very good job. Otherwise, there would have been more casualties and more deaths if it wasn't for them. No, I see my baby in the water. I jump for the ship. I take it off all. I jump on the ship. I go take my baby in the water two times. Take my baby in the water. I swim all all. I go on the boat. We was just going to bed, and I had my pajamas on, and the crash came, and it knocked me down. But I got my pair of pants, and I said, Mother, come on, let's go. Finally, the captains, weary, saddened, confused, face the public. Just uh, after the collision, did you check your radar, sir? Uh, no. 
Well, the captain, you know whether it was operating. Right, right gentlemen, no, I can't ask you that. The type I've asked you to stay away from. Yeah. I don't think you ought to ask questions which relate to those matters. Captain, what, in your opinion, was the cause of this accident? Now, now wait a minute, gentlemen, happened. don't go into now, the conclusions you see, you of see, the Andrew Dory's this... conduct or whatever. Now, gentlemen, this is not a maritime hearing. The suitable rescue was made possible because of the discipline and calm of the passenger and the sense of duty of my officer and crew. The investigation that followed was inconclusive. Blame was never fixed, merely laid again to human error. You know, there's a lot of modern life that we take for granted. We assume the water that comes out of the tap is fit to drink. We assume the pilot of a jet airliner knows what he's doing. We assume elevators will carry us up a tube of air and deposit us safely in the middle of the sky and that we'll get back down again. They dazzle the eye and stir the imagination. They represent progress, a triumph of technology. Man making room for himself in an ever more crowded world. Like the faded Tower of Babel skyscrapers soar ever upward in imitation of immortality. Sao Paulo, Brazil, is riding a building boom that has carried its population over the six million mark in 20 years. Already the size of Chicago, it has become the epicenter of Brazil's economic explosion. New apartments house the new people who flocked here to be a part of their country's future. Olivia de Mayajo lived on a quiet street on the fringe of the city. She hated the long drive to work, but the place was roomy, comfortable, and affordable. No matter what time I set the clock, I'm always rushed. They do not say anything when I'm late, but I don't like it. But there is never any time. Olivia worked downtown in the Cressifal Bank. In a land where brain power is in demand, the traditional Latin bars to women in business were rapidly coming down. The morning of February 1st, 1974, the height of summer in Brazil, was sunny but rain was forecast for the afternoon. I wore something light because it was so muggy. They make us wear uniforms at the bank, but it's all right. It, it saves my clothes. The Cressifal Bank occupied the 25-story Shoelma building downtown. The bottom floors were devoted to parking. The city's building code insisted there be adequate parking provided for every new structure. Other provisions of the building code were not that strict. It makes no sense to wear nice clothes in this heat. By the time I get to the bank, I am wet with perspiring. But at least I can hang them up. Oh, you know, during the day wearing the uniform. Then it's all right to go out after work. Olivia liked her life in this modern city. She was looking forward to a growing future. She was also looking forward to her date that night. But it was a date she was never to keep. At about two in the afternoon, an air conditioning unit on the 12th floor overheats, igniting the insulation material surrounding the ducts. Flames race upward and outward with incredible speed. The building goes up like a torch.
It was too sudden. One moment there was smoke coming out of the air conditioning. The, the next moment the walls were on fire. Later investigation will show that the entire building had been lined with a plastic insulation that was highly flammable. Authorities are helpless. The city has only 13 fire stations. Chicago has 300. The crowds which gather quickly hinder the progress of even these units. Somebody pulled me out onto a balcony, but there was nothing there. I don't know how long we were there, holding on to each other. It, it was a lifetime. Unable to land on the roof, some helicopters hovered close enough to lower rescuers to the balconies. First aid is milk to counter the irritation of smoke inhalation. Emergency stations are set up on nearby rooftops, but some fire officials fear these buildings might catch too. Among other facts about the building's construction that will come out later is the absence of fire stairs. No one had ever thought any would be needed. As the lower floors burn out, firemen are able to raise ladders. These can extend only a third of the way up the building. Low water pressure limits the range of the hoses, too. But those who have managed to stay out of reach of the hungry flames begin their climb out of hell. Others never make it. Things fell past us. I did not notice, but then somebody said they're jumping. Some fall. Some have no choice but to jump. Some shout goodbye as they go. Firemen hold up signs, stay calm. The danger is past. it is obvious little can be done. One fireman, Sergeant Jose Rufino, manages to rig ropes from a nearby building. Crawling along these thin lifelines 25 stories above the street, he leads 18 people to safety before a falling body almost knocks him off. Then the ropes burn through. I had only one thought, not to move, no semesha. It was in my head like a gong. I don't know why. The 
final toll is 220 dead, burned, suffocated, or crumpled on the sidewalks. Some 250 more are in the hospital. Two years earlier, another high-rise fire in Sao Paulo had claimed nine lives. But it hadn't attracted much attention. I was brought down by a fireman, they tell me. I do not know. I guess I was. You know, not in my mind. The fire burns for four hours until there is nothing left to burn, until it is out. For those who survive, it is a miracle. For the families of those who do not, it is a travesty. Since then, the city's firefighting equipment has been increased and the building code revised. But elsewhere in the world, how many towers are waiting to be immortalized in tragic headlines? I don't know. I thought maybe I would go back to Sobral, but I can't do that. But I can't go in that building again. It's probably not true that we are more prone to disaster today than we were in the past. There are more people around, more things, more opportunities to be sure. But it is still safer, for example, to ride in a jet airplane than to take a bath. Man, the maker, is a remarkable creature. So long as he remembers he is man, not God. The San Andreas Fault runs through California like a taut string, a visible crease in the fabric of the landscape. It comes up out of the sea of Cortez in Mexico and runs for over 500 miles before plunging into the Pacific Ocean. It's been measured, plotted, studied, and feared. Once at the beginning of this century, it slipped and all but destroyed the city of San Francisco. Today, it lies like a sleeping giant, while cities rise on its back. Scientists wait anxiously for signs that it will wake again, stretch, and bring them tumbling down. There have been movements along the fault line, small shifts that crack roads, bend tracks as if they were rubber, there have even been minor quakes, preludes, in the opinion of some scientists, to another inevitable major one. Earthquakes are scary because you can't really predict them. As far as I'm concerned, you're just courting disaster when you put nuclear reactors along fault lines. The atom represents an ultimate kind of power over nature. For the first time, man can seriously, and perhaps irreversibly, wreak havoc with his own environment. The waste products alone, simple pinpoints of which are hideously deadly, take 25,000 years to disintegrate. 25,000 years. That's five times the length of recorded human history to date. None of us will be here in 25,000 years. It is more than likely that no one who even remembers us will be here in 25,000 years. The question is, what will? The danger is not that a nuclear reactor in earthquake country will explode like some gigantic atomic bomb. The danger is that it will leak slowly, releasing its wastes into the earth, the water, the very air. The danger is not that there will be some monstrous catastrophe that will send the earth up in a spectacular display of pyrotechnics. The danger is that we will waste away. The danger is that we will go out 
Not with a bang. But with a whimper.